Hello, everybody. Welcome. If you are um, just tuning in, feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're listening from tonight. We'll get started in just a few moments. Uh, we'll wait for uh, the folks to log in and get situated. But um, like I said, if you'd like to uh, share a note, tell me where you're tuning in from, we'd love to hear. Hello from Sammamish, Washington, Hellsburg, California. Hello from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Hello from Las Vegas, hi. Hello from the Berkshires. Hi from Green Lake, just around the corner here. Hamilton, Canada, Ballard. Welcome everybody. Hi from Finney Ridge. Fremont, <laughs> Los Angeles. Okay, we are gonna get started here in just a moment, um, but in the meantime, hello, welcome. My name is Magna. I am a staff member here at Book Larder in Seattle. Uh, we're based in the Fremont neighborhood. And um, as some of you may or may not know, we are open by appointments. And um, due to COVID, we actually have transitioned most of our events to online, um, the Zoom platform. Uh, one of the upsides of doing that is obviously we get to host folks from all over the world and all over the country. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we are going to get started in just a few minutes here, but I wanted to take a minute to, uh, to thank uh, Chef Annalise Gregory and um, Seattle blogger, Ashley Rodriguez for joining us today. Uh, we are going to hear about Annalise's book, uh, How Wild Things Are. It's a stunning, stunning book. Uh, we just got it in earlier this week. Um, it was newly released this week. So um, if you haven't come in to make an appointment and check out our um, selection of books, definitely come by. Um, for tonight's event, we are asking that if you um, would like to chat with other participants, other attendees tonight, please use the chat function. And um, do remember to um, select the, um, the message being sent to all panelists and attendees. Um, if you send it to just the panelists, it'll only be myself and our two guests that'll see that, um, that message. If you have any questions, uh, we are going to be um, answering questions. You can pop them into the Q&A function at the very bottom of your screen. That way, um, Ashley can read the questions out loud. We will try to get to as many questions as we can tonight. Um, so, so hang tight. And um, we're going to get started in just a moment. Before we get started, um, Chef Annalise Gregory is joining us from Tasmania today. So thank you so much. Um, joining her in conversation is Ashley Rodriguez, who is a cookbook author based here in Seattle. Um, she also has a wonderful blog called Not Without Salt. Um, I'm sure both of them will talk a little bit more about Tasmania and also Ashley's blog later tonight. Um, also, if you know someone who um, is interested in checking out the event tonight, but maybe couldn't make it, this talk will be posted to our YouTube channel within 48 hours. Um, so you can check that out on our website or on YouTube. Uh, I will be sure to share a link to our channel page in the chat function. Um, without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Annalise and Ashley. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so excited to hear from both of you. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Oh, what a treat to get to talk to you this evening. Well, it's evening here in the Pacific Northwest. It looks bright and sunshiny where you're at. It's like yep. in it's, Tasmania. Yes, it's it's kind of like we get to travel. Right? A little bit. <laughs> Oh, I should like take the computer out and about and show yes. you the rounds. <laughs> oh, you should take us foraging back in those woods back there. That would be amazing. Um, someday, someday we'll do that for real. But for now, we do have the gift of technology to be able to come together and speak tonight. And I really appreciate you being here. I feel so incredibly honored to have this conversation with you. 
and yeah, appreciate your time and really appreciate you creating this stunning, stunning book. This is like, oh my gosh, when the book larder reached out to me about um, the, the opportunity to chat with you about this book, I jumped at it. This is, this is how I do food. It is oh, gorgeous. I love, I love wild foods love cooking outside. Um, I will need your recommendation for how I can substitute wallaby because we don't have it in Seattle. So if you have any recommendations, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we do, maybe someone's going to say, no, Ashley, we do. So um, anyways, I have so many questions and I'm sure everyone in the audience has questions too. So um, feel free to put the questions in the Q&A. I'll go ahead with a few of my questions, but I won't hog up all the time. Um, and then we'll get to them towards the end of our conversation. So, gosh, there's so, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. You have quite the history and journey and you're so young. And so I want to, I want to hear more about that. But what I find so incredible is that the first two words in your book are oat and feral and they're used to describe you <laughs> which are two you know not two words that one normally thinks of as putting together do you think that's an is it an accurate description and can you talk more about that what that means to you yep i'll just put down my baby chicken yeah. um, <laughs> yes <laughs> well that's Maybe a normal sentence <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> I suppose, uh, I don't know, like I used to live in Paris, I was one of these people that would go past, um, like I would walk past Vanessa Bruno and like all of these shops every day, and then would save up and buy, you know, like rabbit fur handbags and, you know, things like this and like, you know, ridiculous shoes. But then also, since moving to Tasmania, I'm someone that will like go and like dive on, like cook on Bruni Island for three days and just be, be like totally wild and like not brush my hair and just, I don't know, get out into nature. And so there's, I know they're two kind of very different things um, and it can be difficult to, to bring them together. Yeah. I love that though. I mean, I, I get that and I've never seen, yeah, I've never seen someone described in that way, but it's like, oh my gosh, I totally get that. I, I can walk around in heels and also walk around in waders and feel comfortable in both. So, you know, it's a, yeah. <laughs> I just, I think that's a beautiful way of being described and I, it, it caught me off guard, but it also, it says so much and it sets up the book so beautifully of um, just telling, telling about you and your journey. Um, I also, there's this line that I also think is quite possibly my favorite line and favorite way I've ever heard someone describe. So it says, she eats butter like cheese and walks fast, but at home she cooks slowly and with ingredients close at hand. First of all, I hear you on the eating butter like cheese. I get that, that's, I get that. Um, but I would love to hear a little bit about your journey because you started in restaurant kitchens and now your, your life looks really different. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. Ooh, um, I started in restaurant kitchens when I was about 16 in New Zealand, so really young. And um, then, you know, kind of did a tour of the world cooking in, you know, Michelin starred restaurants. So moved to London, um, cooked over there, then to Paris, um, countryside France, Spain, uh, Morocco. That was a bit of a deviation. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and in Sydney for a long time, in Sydney on and off for 10 years. And um, it was after cooking in countryside France that uh, I just like, I moved back to Sydney and I used to love the like 24 hour nature of everything and how I could go downstairs and go to a supermarket at 1 a.m. and cook something if I wanted to or go to a bar. And then suddenly that just wasn't what I wanted at all anymore. And um, I felt really disconnected from it. And I was just like wandering the streets um, were filled with people and just like wanting to be back like in the hills and in the mountains, like, you know, picking wildflowers for work and growing vegetables and like, you know, hiking with like a baguette and a bottle of wine mm -hmm. and a cheese and like, all, you know, the lifestyle that I had had there. 
And then I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong place, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to break out of it or like how to move or how to leave or where to find what I wanted apart from like just moving back to France. Um, and then I just, uh, one day I got a cold call from the people who are in Franklin restaurant and they're like, have you ever considered moving to Tasmania? I was like, well, no, <laughs> but um, I'll think about it now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I had a few conversations with them and then I was like, okay, I'll give it six months. Um, and just like drove down with a suitcase, put my car on the ferry uh, with my pet rabbit as my passenger. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then four years later, I'm still here. And now I own a small farm and I live in the very far south of Tasmania. So it's truly the bottom of the world. Um, and yeah, my entire life has changed. And I would never have imagined this happening five years ago. This is the last thing in the world I would have thought that I would be doing now. Wow. That is, that is quite the journey, full, full circle, a few, few twists and turns along the way, but wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing. I, I love, you know, it's talking about she walks fast, but at home she cooks slowly. Can you, and with ingredients close at hand, which I absolutely love. Can you talk about how, what, what, how was the process different from you from your time in cooking in restaurants to now you're cooking at home and living on the farm? What does that look, how is that different? Um, I have very much my own schedule now. So I don't know, it's liberating in that way of like my entire professional life. I've like essentially gone to work in some form of box and then been like, you have to be here for 12 to 16 hours and you cannot leave apart from to go to the bathroom occasionally. And so I've been doing that for the last sort of 19 years, I suppose. And then now I'm like, um, I'm like, okay, so I have these things that I have to do today and like write recipes and whatnot. And I'm like, but sometimes I'll like, you know, be in the kitchen, like working on a recipe at 1am. Um, there's lots of late night baking that happens, um, things like this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, very, very different lifestyle. The other day I was having breakfast with some chef friends in Hobart and um, everyone was like, oh, you know, what does your day involve? And it's like, yeah, going to work, you know, at like 10 and then probably finish at midnight and stuff. And then they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, so yeah, I need to go um, forage some wild cherry plums and then go pick some fennel and then go home and make shrubs. And they were just oh. like, look at me, like, what? what is your life? <laughs> I need to go babysit my baby chicks. <laughs> <laughs> they, they you know anything could happen if they're on their own last time I left they got eaten that's why oh, they have to yeah. we don't we don't want that don't want them no. to get eaten. they're way too no. cute they're so sweet do they have names do you name your chicks uh no not until I'm sure that I'm keeping them got that's it I learned early on um the first time I had to kill a rooster and his name was Adam one that I had raised from being an egg um that was a really difficult time I was oh. like, maybe I shouldn't bond with them that much. Yeah. Oh, oh. One of my chickens' name is Annabelle Thunderdome, which is, <laughs> but I lost How track. Did you of, come about? What's that? How did you come about that name? You know, it, ju it just, it just, I just was inspired by this chicken, but the, they grew up and I couldn't tell them apart. And so I don't know if she's the one that's actually living or. <laughs> So there's this natural separation that happened, but they're fun. They're fun. And it's one of those things too, that like, it just is that daily connection to your food that I'm, sh you know, that I'm sure that you get with foraging and hunting and fishing and diving and all these incredible things that you do. When did that start for you? Really? Um, I've always enjoyed visiting farms and then Kind of felt like that was the best part of my job as a chef was when you know the occasional time that you got to go out and like visit the suppliers and uh and get back into nature and then when i moved to tasmania i mean part of it was because i wanted to have the ability to do that more often so like i'm not in hobart but even in hobart like you'd literally be you could get in your car within 30 minutes you could be at most of the suppliers houses like for the restaurant you could just be on the farm in like the middle of nowhere um, so it made those things a lot more accessible and then yeah it's really been here since that I um, have really gotten into diving and fishing. That's so great what kind of fishing do, is there in Tasmania? Uh, all types but um, so mainly I line fish for scale fish um, there's also lots of squid at certain times of the year as well mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people fishing for squid off jetties um, 
I go out fishing off boats. Generally, um, if I have access to a boat though, I'll go for a dive because I don't know there's just something about being in the water as opposed to being on top of the water. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I was watching, you did an episode for um, Gordon Ramsay's new show, Uncharted. I was watching uh, that and <laughs> I really love your interaction with him. And you talk about ta Tasmania. You describe it, it's fair and tough. That's Tassie. Um, and in that you're, you're telling him that part of Tasmanian culture, right, is to bring a gift and give gifts and, and all of that. And you all will have to watch it, but you end up taking his watch, which <laughs> I think is amazing. Um, but I love this idea of the, that, you know, introducing us to Tasmanian culture and this idea, this act of reciprocity and that you teach, you know, this beautiful cultural norm as part of, of what Tasmania is. Can you tell us a little bit more about Tasmania and, and why, you know, you've created such a beautiful home there. Um, Tassie was always the place I would come to for like a weekend r and when I was working in Sydney and at Key. Um, so like it was in the world's 50 best restaurants at that stage and, you know, doing like 16 hour days every day. And then, um, you know, I'd get to a point where I was really tired and just needed to get away. And so I'd always come down to Tassie and I would like stay in Hobart, like climb the mountain because Hobart's one of those towns, like a bit like Kyoto, um, where, you know, you can kind of like see the green out the outside of the city. Um, that kind of makes you want to, you know, explore beyond the boundaries of the houses. Uh, so I would climb the mountain, get some fresh air, um, go to a couple of restaurants, be amazed at like the produce that they had and how good it was. And then I slowly made a few friends here, like some natural wine importers. And then I would come down and we would have like gougiers and aperitif in their garden before like I went out. And I was like, oh, this place is very civilized and has a really solid food and wine culture for like such a small city. Um, so I was quite attached to it like before I moved down and then also working at Key, a lot of the produce that we had, like we had live uh, tanks there for fish and things and like the crayfish were from Tasmania, would have Tasmanian abalone in a tank, um, potatoes will come in from Tasmania, um, like snow crabs, like all kinds of things, tripe yeah. trump all the stuff would just arrive from like with Tasmania marked on the box in the kitchen and I was like what is this magical island where all of these pristine ingredients come from what is this place wow it, it does sound magical what what's in season now what are you out foraging for these days uh at the moment so it's just kind of the end of stone fruit season and then it's coming into um like apple season so where I live in the Huon Valley there's a lot of like forgotten orchards and things like that so heaps of like roadside fruit um mm. so lots of apples and pears at the moment uh wild fennel um yeah those are the main things but then like autumn's kind of like just starting to hit and so it'll be like wild mushroom season soon which will be great it'll be amazing it's one of my favorites we're all here in i mean there's a good chunk of us here in seattle we're a little jealous because we are deep in our gray season but you know, we'll, we'll get there. That just sounds so dreamy. So this book, I mean, the food, I got to just show off some of the pictures. The food is just absolutely, let's see. And all oh, those, those gougeres you were talking about. And, That's oh, from this, Roger and Sue. That's, yeah. to go to. That's amazing. This, I cannot wait to try the charcoal oyster mushrooms. Oh. Oh, that's actually, that's a really good one. We used to cook that at Franklin in the restaurant. And um, it, was oh, really it looks so, and the photography is, you know, like the wild ingredients and you get such a beautiful sense of the place and oh, this, come on, so gorgeous. Um, yeah, it's really stunning. How would you kind of characterize the personality of your food? How would you describe it? Oh, I feel like it's changed a lot over time. Um, because I mainly learned to cook in London and then in France, um, it used to be very kind of, shall we say, Franklish. Um, I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, um, but then as time's gone on, I've been able to incorporate more um, influences from other places, like um, from when I lived like outside of San Sebastian in Spain, um, from like Southwest France when I lived there, and then also my... Um, 
my one of my grandmothers was Chinese and so I grew up on a lot of Cantonese food because my mum was half Chinese and that's what she knew um so yeah I grew up on like stir fries and stroop waffles and things like a really odd mix of food stir but, um, fries and stroop waffles maybe that's the title of your second book maybe it is it'll be a strange Chinese Dutch mashup um, yeah <laughs> I, I have, I'm a hundred percent Dutch. So I, this, you mentioned stroop waffles and I'm there. I'm, I'm there. Uh, stroop waffles. Yes. The salted licorice, not so much. No, you don't, you don't do it. Doubles out. Not your thing. Yeah, Anyone not. in the audience have doubles out? It was like, I started eating that when I was a baby. It's like, it's a, it's a thing. It's not for everyone though. Hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, someone's asking, what is that? It is a very, very dark, yes, double salt, dark licorice, very salty. And you can get it everywhere in the Netherlands of, you know, they, they range in, in varying saltiness, but yeah, doubles out is the double salt. That is, it is intense. The Dutch, you know, maybe not known for their food, but... <laughs> Oh, there must be some things. Um, uh, yes, stem pot. Yeah. That's that's my favorite. So, yeah, um, I guess there's like a lot of different influences, and so that's kind of why it seems natural to then um, relate the recipes into different sections, so that the things from mm -hmm. New Zealand are more like um, you know, like kiwi things that we would go and cook at the beach like you know I grew up on like going to the beach and like snapper fishing and you know getting pippies out of the sand and you know like power fritters and white bait fritters and I know we seem to make everything into fritters in New Zealand and um but then also like you know then we'd go home and have like congee for breakfast and stuff like this and have like you know whole flakes and like my lunch box and stuff and like I was always that kid with the lunch that like no one wanted <laughs> It sounds my delicious. Mother, I want my mother it. understand how to make sandwiches. Being Chinese does not lend you to be able to make sandwiches with white bread. She just didn't get it at all. Yeah. I don't know. It's not congee con sounds. I would, yep, I would eat that. But yeah, as a kid, no. It's a different, different experience. But yeah, this book, it 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 does read like a a memoir told through food. And you can see just how much what an incredible journey that you've been on and, and vast amounts of experience and different tastes from all your travels. Um, it's described as it says, more than a recipe book, this is Annalise's journey, an homage to a place at the bottom of the world that lured her and took her in to good food, taking risks, and to knowing that real beauty, the kind of beauty we seek in nature often comes with struggle. And I mean, this it's the best kind of cookbook that really is just full of heart and you can equally find its place when you're curled up in bed reading the book and want to jump into the kitchen at the same time. I, I love that line that's talking about the kind of beauty that we seek in nature that often comes with struggle. And I want to, why, why go through that struggle? Why is it important for you to, to be so connected with, um, the wild foods and going going out and diving and and getting that deep and intimate and personal with your food i suppose it's just it's what feels right to me now that like now if i was to go back to a kitchen where everything came in you know delivered in like a little plastic container wrapped with cling film like i just wouldn't really feel okay about it and i've definitely worked in places like that before but these days I would feel really strange about it and I don't know if I'd be able to do it or if I'd be happy doing it. Like things have just changed over time. And then this, I used to think it was unfortunate to be honest because I started to like worry about things more and more. And I started to like, if people weren't recycling in the kitchen like it would get inside my head and like irk me, like, you know, like some little thing like for constantly throughout the day. And I was like, um, and then I, and I was like, oh, this means that like, I can't work in certain places anymore because like, I just won't be okay with like waste and all of these things. I just slowly became more and more like aware of the world and of nature and of, um, you know, became one of those people that wanted to like lobby the council to start, um, you know, like composting for restaurants and things like this. And that's really hard in a big city. Um, like I was doing that in Sydney and, um, 
and it was really difficult and I often felt like I was you know kind of beating my head against a wall but um I suppose then in Tasmania I've kind of found like a group of like-minded people where um like a lot of people are really eco-minded down here and um so I go to local restaurants and they save me food for my pigs and so I drive around and pick up all the restaurant waste and then I feed it to my pigs um who will one one day become like bacon and prosciutto and all those things and um yeah I've managed to like without really thinking about it I've kind of made a life that has like a lot less of a, an impact that like I guess treads more lightly in a way mm -hmm. like I see everything and do everything but like I don't generate a lot of waste and I kind of like live with the world more I, I feel there's something really nice about it and and like it makes me calmer like if I'm really anxious or really stressed like I have been in most of my professional life um like just tapping out and going and climbing a mountain to the point where like your knees tremble um and it just totally takes your mind off everything or going and like diving and being under the ocean where like you know there's no noise the only sound in the ocean is like the sound of the sea of the waves you can't hear anything which makes it worrying when like you know suddenly like a shark will swim past or like a really big way and you're like whoa shit <laughs> uh, so I do, I do scream a lot sometimes when I'm diving and then I hope that no one on the surface could hear it <laughs> oh my gosh well you know I think a scream is valid when you see a shark no big deal that's crazy I yeah that's yeah, beautiful sorry what was <laughs> no you I could just hear you I could just listen to you talking about that all the time and I I, I can relate to that so um so much yeah I, I spent some time working in restaurant kitchens and um and have a number of I have three children and you get into this grind and then like you go outside and you look up and the expanse of the sky and the trees and you know I'm we're close to the sound here and you just go and you experience something that's so much bigger than yourself and suddenly all your to-do lists and emails and everything just feels so much more trivial and feel at ease and, and calm and um so it's cool to to hear you talk about that and how you know when you kind of have the opportunity to slow down and really understand that if we allow the process to sort of naturally happen it is this beautiful cycle like you know the food that's feeding us then the leftovers are fed to the pigs and the pigs then are feeding us and it is that's you know it's circular and that again that idea of reciprocity you give a gift you get a gift even to pigs right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah there's a really beautiful feeling about it and um i don't know sometimes i wake up here and like walk out and feed the chickens and it's like sunny and i look at like all the trees and the orchard and stuff and i'm like oh this is like this is what i wanted my life to be like mm -hmm. and here we are but like it's it wasn't easy to get here and I guess maybe it never is. Yeah, I think the, you know, the hardships of the journey makes you appreciate all the more when you get to the destination, right? Yes. Um, I know so there's a few questions happening and if you have more questions, put them up in the chat and I'll get to them really quickly. But maybe um, for me, selfishly, I, I love cooking over the fire. I know that you love cooking over the fire. I would just love to hear a little bit about your your perspective on that and what what is that process like for you and and why why cook over the fire? Um, well, so when I went to work at Franklin, I come from like normal restaurants, so lots of induction, lots of gas cooktops, things like that. And then um, suddenly I was confronted with this um, two ton wood fired Scotch oven, which was a massive beast. So I called it Dante, as in the Inferno. <laughs> um, it was huge. You could fit like six of me inside there. It was massive. And I was like, oh, this is new. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is such man cooking. Because there'd be like guys coming through with like trolleys of logs to feed the fire and stuff. I was like, oh, I'm really going to have to get to grips with this. But so then I did. So I just started cooking everything in it and um, putting stuff in overnight to see what happened and using it to like dry stuff out on top and fermenting misos on top of it because there was lots of latent heat. And then I came around to really loving it. And then like a year later if I went to cook at any food festivals or anywhere I was like oh but you do have a wood-fired oven right or at least like a charcoal grill 
I was like, I can't, I don't just don't know if it would be the same if I cooked on something else. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is becoming an issue now. Like I'm totally sold on this way of cooking um, with fire and with coals that I didn't want to cook on anything else anymore. And I felt like the food was different and I started to miss the like, you know, the little bit of smoke and the like, you know, the charred bits that like when you first start cooking that way, you're like, oh, it's burnt. But then you come to a new understanding of different types of black and there's burnt and yeah. <laughs> Different, exactly. types, different types of black. I like that. That's I'm, I'm going to use that because people are like, no, it's burnt. It's like, burnt. there's it's flavor. Burnt. Yeah. Um, and then I bought this really old house in the um, Huon Valley in the Tasmanian countryside. And um, in the kitchen, there's like a 1980s um, Westinghouse Kimberley, which is fully electric. Two of the elements don't work. And um, it's just like on or off. There's nothing in between. Um, and the first thing I cooked on it, I burnt incredibly. And I was like, oh, and I cook for a living. This is horrible. <laughs> this is weird. I was like, have I just wasted like 15 years of my life? <laughs> what have I been doing all this time? Yeah, having an existential like, crisis. <laughs> really massive existential crisis was trying to make like fried eggs. <laughs> on like my first day in the new house. <laughs> I was like, what are the chickens going to think? <laughs> I was like, I can't put them outdoors because the chickens will be like, look what you did to our eggs. <laughs> They're going to stop laying in protest. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. And judge me. And so, <laughs> I, um, so I got some rocks and built a fireplace on the front lawn and then cooked outdoors for the entire first year of living here. Oh, that's my dream. That's my dream. Like, yep. Don't need a kitchen. Just, just a, just a fire pit. So um, I would get home and then just like light a fire, come inside, do some prep or do something and then just go back outdoors. And like once it had burnt down a little bit and I have like a tripod with um, like a hoist that you can raise or lower. So yeah, um, you want to have those. the ability to be like way or closer to the coals. That makes it a lot easier. And yeah, just started cooking on the lawn all the time. Amazing. I love it. It sounds, it sounds perfect. So wonderful. All right, I'm gonna hop into the Q&A here and grab some of these questions. All right, so what kind of animals are hunted in Tassie? Is it, a, is it different than animals hunted on the mainland? Uh, similar, maybe slightly different in terms of permits, but so in Tassie, um, there's wild deer, um, wallabies, possums, rabbits, uh, there's a few ducks, but those are the, those are the main ones. I guess it's like it sounds exotic and strange, but it's that they're the animals that are native to here. So it's just like what you guys hunt in America or what people would hunt in the UK. It's just that they have pheasants and we don't. Right. I'm curious what possum tastes like. Um, kind of like, oh, so I would say a farmed rabbit crossed with hmm like like rabbit and lamb or something together oh. like very kind of soft and sweet and the same sort of like um like muscle breakdown as a rabbit like very similar body shape wise yeah okay. but, but like the outside um the outside cuts are really tough I don't know what they do in their lifetime maybe it's all the jumping so tough <laughs> I cooked one one day like the first time I cooked a possum the same way I'd cook a rabbit like to like French style and like made a galantine and I was like oh the belly is not good oh, <laughs> I was like the wings were like soft enough to be able to um cook traditionally yeah and I was like okay so the rest of it is like a confit thing or a slow cooking thing hmm. wow uh, someday I want to try it I want to try it all uh okay so what is the restaurant culture like in Tasmania? What sort of foods or dishes do the local people eat? And is it different than Sydney? Oh, um, I'd say it's very local produce based down here because we are a, another small island and the quarantine in Tassie is really strict. That you can't really bring in any fruit or veg or honey or meat or anything like that. Um, so it's really just like what's grown and produced around the island. But so lots of seafood, heaps of oysters, abalone, um, crayfish, uh, lots of those things. And also the water is really cold here. So it's like, I think about it as being like, I suppose like 
up in the Atlantic and then also um, like around Hokkaido and stuff in Japan where the water is really cold and the sea urchin is really sweet. Um, so like all those types of things are really good. The cold water seems to make a lot of the seafood really great. And um, but the restaurant culture is like it's like small and um, and everyone's quite close. Like everyone knows each other's names and will like say hi to each other at the pub and stuff like this. Like it's kind of I know it's cute. Like I yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's much more inclusive. That's beautiful. Man, good food in a tight community. It sounds amazing. Um, oh, someone would, Bethany, would love to hear more about your underwater adventures and foraging adventures about specific to your area. Um, so about say 25 minutes where I live. I just found a new dive spot the other day. Um, so I mainly shore dive because that's, you know, easy. Like I have a wetsuit and stuff and you can just do that anytime. So it's free diving, but with a snorkel. And um, I can just go in and get like sea urchins and abalone there. Like I just drive up to like 25 minutes from my house, park on the side of like the road, walk down for, like to the rocks and then just go off the rocks. And the other day there were some guys getting crayfish there. So I was like, oh, I need to come back and go for a more investigative search of this area. Um, but those are the times where I'm like, this is amazing. I've made the best life decisions. <laughs> you like get out of the water and I've got like four abalone and some sea urchin and I'm only 25 minutes from home. I'm like, this is good. Um, so yeah, one of my kind of like slightly, uh, one of my new favorite things to do is like, I just go and go for a dive and get sea urchins and then like get creme fraiche and like really good potato chips and just come home and just like oat them and just open them and sit there and eat them like, like that. <laughs> oh, oh, it feels kind of, that is amazing. It feels a little bit off, but also really right at the same time. Yeah, that's that's you're doing it right. You're doing it right. Maybe you can just do some little uh tradesies with the crayfish guys that you know. Maybe. Oh, I did I had a little camp stove with me and I cooked some abalone on the rocks. Of course, of course you did. That is beautiful. Um, okay. Can you describe the Tasmanian environment more? I imagine Tasmania as a very rugged place and I'm curious as to how difficult it is to forage and hunt in such a wild place. Uh, very rugged, quite untouched. It's kind of for me a cross between um, say South Island of New Zealand and then also like mainland Australia. So parts are very foresty and rugged and cold and high rainfall and then other parts are quite like scrubby and that like Australian bush kind of feel. So it's really like a, a mixture of those of those things. There's parts like down in the Southwest, um, like the Southwest National Park where like there's places that like you'd have to walk into for three days that like people don't really go to. And that's part of what I love about it, that it feels like one of those few wildernesses that is still kind of like a bit relatively untouched in some ways. And there's so few parts of the world that are like that these days. Um, so yeah, parts of the coast, a lot of it is like sail into only. Um, a lot of the good dive spots uh, you can only access by boat, which is why you need to make friends with boats. Um, that's been high on the agenda since I moved here. <laughs> I was like, oh, how do you get over there? Tasmania priority number one, find people with boats. Yep, so I went out and got my boat license last year. Um, I was like, not because I really like have any urge to drive a boat, but just to a means to an end. Yeah. To be able to get to the spots that I want to go to. <laughs> Although I would not trust me driving a boat at all, but don't tell other people that. Like, I have a card that says I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to mean something. Someone trusts you. <laughs> but yeah, so some of the harder to get to places, um, boat only. And then also I went down to the Southwest one day in like a four seater plane. It was like a flying two CV. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's how you get into some of the more out of the way places, I suppose. Wow. Mm. Sounds amazing. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, there's such good questions. And I feel like we can chat with you all night, but we'll do a few more. Um, okay, Caitlin says, first of all, I loved Tasmania when I visited. It truly was magical, sublime seafood. I dined in Hobart three years ago and Franklin was a favorite. It seemed that many chefs were from the other states in Australia or ex expats from other countries. What is it about Tassie that attracts young talent? And building off of that, how do you predict the Tasmanian food community will evolve in the future? 
And how do you envision the Australian food scene involving overall? Would love to hear your thoughts on the future food system in Melbourne and your upcoming projects. Oh, this is a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of questions all in one. There's a lot Great of questions. Question. Okay, where, where are we going to start with that bit? Um, I suppose like the pandemic hit pretty hard in Tassie like it did everywhere, but um, the community really banded together a lot down here. So like I started a Friday lunch pop up and, um, and was just like making things that I'd make at home and then just like selling them takeaway to people. There was a lot of people like sharing space and like closed kitchens and closed restaurants and, you know, starting like dumpling pop-ups and things like this, which was really great. Um, I spent a lot of time foraging food and then taking it to restaurants, um, being like, well, if I go and pick them like five kilos of mushrooms or apples or something, that's food that they haven't had to pay for that they can then sell. And then we lost quite a few restaurants, including Franklin, which is really sad. Um, and the ones that have reopened, a lot of people have taken the time to, I guess, sit down and like really go through the figures and a lot of them have reopened as a menu only and with like, like pre-selling tickets um, or taking credit card reservations and doing like two seating times, whereas it used to be a lot more like a la carte and just rock up whenever you want. Um, so in a way, I'm still adjusting to that as a diner too, because you have that thing in your head of like, oh, it's just Sunday and I just want to go out to dinner. And then you're like, wait a minute, I can't because I would have had to have thought about this and pre-books. But like as a hospo person, I get that that's what they need to do to make them viable and that's what they need to do to survive. So I think there's a little like, mental shift we all need to go through there, like myself included. And it's probably going to be the same like that all over the world, I think. Um, that restaurants will, yeah, have to assess like exactly what they have to do to make everything viable in the future. And there probably will be less of them. But also, I guess one of the things that I took away from last year was that like how much I appreciate being able to dine out. It's like I hadn't realized before because I kind of took it for granted maybe. And then it was one of the things that like six weeks of just sitting on my couch and not leaving the house. I was like, I really miss just walking into a venue and being able to sit down and even just have someone pour me water and speak to me and maybe bring a martini or a glass of champagne or something and I would just sit there and fantasize about that and then I was like wow restaurants are a huge part of what I enjoy about life um and it made me a lot more like thankful I think um mm -hmm. which is good and if especially if it has that effect on other people too to make us realize that maybe we did take some of the hospitality industry for granted Absolutely. and uh, for that to like change in the future. I, I was just in Sydney last weekend, even though it's like, it's still kind of horrible traveling at the moment, to be honest, I'm just happy staying in Tasmania. I'm like happy with the goats and the chickens, don't need to go anywhere at the moment. And yeah, it was a weird feeling. It was a lot quieter than I've ever seen it before. And probably 50% of places were closed. And this was like me walking around on a Friday night, just like looking. And places have definitely reduced their opening hours and stuff like that as well, whereas it used to be somewhere that like you could just go anywhere at any time and, and get something decent to eat. It was like really kind of a struggle, like late at night or on a Sunday or something. And I was like, oh, I'm not used to the city being like this. But I suppose that's part of the future too, that everyone's like, well, if it costs us this much extra to open from like, you know, 10 till midnight, we're just going to close at 10. Mm. I was like, as a diner, I feel like I need to be, a bit more organized in the future and like think about things a bit more yeah that's an uh, that's an adjustment for sure but i i love what you said about just appreciating restaurants all the more i think yeah it's something that we take for took for granted and didn't realize that how much we just need that that community and and what a gift they are to all around us moment because I've been eating out a lot less I still get really excited when I go and sit down in a restaurant at the moment I'm like whoa does that make you want to be in the restaurants again or what is or are you just enjoying being a diner uh just enjoying being a, a diner at the moment because also like um I've become like one of the people because I'm not running a restaurant at the moment that a lot of my friends who are restaurant owners talk to because I guess I have like the mental space and I'm kind of like more observational and objective about things now because I'm not like in the thick of it just trying to make it work and so I'm like hmm I think you should do a shopping system as this so maybe I'm a good person to like give advice about things now uh, whereas before I was like I'm just trying to control my own kitchen and my own environment I don't know what you should do um, so you've become like a chef therapist 
kind of yeah especially yeah. Um, living in the country like I do as well and then like cooking on the lawn and stuff I'm getting a lot of visitors that just come over we open some wines we sit on the, on the lawn I cook a crayfish over a fire or something oh. and like I have a free bedroom house and it's only me that lives here I'm like well just stay you don't need to drive home after this and my next door neighbor was like are you running like a chef therapy clinic over here <laughs> yes it's like come in chefs I'll take care of you so you can go out and feed the people again just like go to the country for two days I just need to like have a spa or something yes yes, yes. the goats can give massages maybe I mean goat yoga that's a thing so there you go so what what are some of your upcoming projects what are you working on these days uh, these days, I'm halfway through filming a television series for SBS Food called A Girl's Guide to Hunting, Fishing and Wild Cooking, where mm -hmm. I go to Tasmania and hunt and fish and light fires in strange places and cook over them. Yes. And yes. Right. And like go to visit like my wallaby hunter on Bruny Island or like go down to like the Southwest National Park to like find beehives, um, stuff like this. Uh, so that's that's quite fun. Um, and what else am I doing? Oh, so I just had the council at my place yesterday. I had this crazy COVID idea, you know, from like, you know, when you're on the couch after many hours from like too many Netflix binges and stuff like that. And I was like, so what if I didn't go back to working in a restaurant and I just cooked from home because like the goats are happier when I'm here and they don't break out and terrorize the neighbors. They get bored really easily. Um, and like, you know, the chickens are better fed and everything just seemed a bit like better when I was here more mm -hmm. um even though I was here because I was supposed to be and um I was like okay so I hatched this idea to open a 10 seater restaurant in um an abandoned veterinary clinic next to my house in my little orchard um and then only open like Friday Saturday Sunday and only do lunch and only cook for 10 people um so I'm trying to go through the council um application process for that at the moment that sounds amazing dreamy so we'll we will see how that goes but like in theory if i did that i only did three days a week because like as a chef you're always trying to figure out like what the end goal is and how you can like bring your life closer to your work and make it so that like so that it's sustainable long term as opposed to just like oh, i can do this for a year or two you know what i mean which is like what i often used to think about jobs that i took i was like yeah i've got 16 hours a day in me for a couple more years um, and now I'm like, so I could garden two days a week and grow vegetables and actually put time into the veggie garden. And then I could use them in the restaurant three days a week, plus like forage, dive, make charcuterie, do all the stuff I normally do. I was like, oh, could really be onto something here. And it's at my house, so there's no rent. So kind of also just um, breaking down the traditional restaurant model and being like, what parts can I take away? How can I change it so that it will suit me more? And also so that maybe it's like better or more profitable. Wow, that's what an incredible model. And I'm sure, you know, that, that prioritizing your health, mental health, and being able to tend to the land so that people can, you know, eat this incredible food and what an experience too. I mean, people love those experiential dining you know, they got the chickens and the goats walking around them and sounds amazing. I see people are saying, well, how do you, how do you make a reservation? They'll fly in from Vegas. So not quite built yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're ready. Not, not we're ready all yet. eager to have things Hopefully to look that's forward that's to. Yeah. And then, yeah, no. the chickens, which friendly, um, the goats, which are all also very friendly, which will be like, pet us, feed us. And then there's two very angry geese, which will then hiss. It's always the That's geese, isn't it? Experience. That's amazing. Oh, that sounds incredible. Uh, Megna, I'm wondering if we have time for some more questions. I know there's been so many incredible questions and I see a few more in there or we're, or, okay, good. She gave me the go ahead. Good, I don't wanna cut anyone off. Um, okay, another question. What ingredients are hard to find in Tasmania that you wish were easier to access, if anything? Oh, like tropical fruit, like mango, pineapple, coconut. I haven't had any of those in ages. Um, those things. And then also, yeah, like more tropical herbs and things. Like sometimes I miss those flavors of like lemongrass. I just started growing a kaffir lime tree because I was like, oh, I miss those things. 
Um, and like all those Thai ingredients that are really easily available in Sydney because of the climate, like all the all those tropical things, that's probably what I miss. Hmm. Oh, and there's no prawns here. And that feels very, very quintessentially Australian. Yeah. All right. I've heard about the threat of climate change to the oceans and sea life around Tasmania. Have you noticed a lack of certain types of fish or sea creatures when you dive? Um, so the main thing is that there's this, oh, what is it called? Like the giant kelp forest, which used to be all around Tasmania. And then now it's only in very certain parts. I've only like swum into it once. And I was just like, oh my God, what are these things that like, it was kind of felt really creepy and really airy. Like you're in this weird murky forest with like the seaweed that goes like 20 meters from the ocean floor, like up to the surface. Then I was like, oh my God, this is the giant kelp forest. This is what it is because so much of it has died off um, mm. because of the global warming. And then the other thing is there's fish down here now that like have never been found here before. Like now you can um, hunt for like kingfish in Tasmania. And like traditionally there are much warmer water species of fish that shouldn't really be here. But that does mean to me that um, yeah, climate change is definitely happening and the water is warming. Yeah. All right. How is the restaurant business there with the pandemic? Um, and how, how are the workers? We talked a little bit about how the restaurants are shifting, but um, yeah, how's the community feeling these days around it all? Apart from the places that closed, I feel like the rest are still, they're like quite busy. I feel like Tassie's in a pretty good spot in those terms at the moment. And then um, the workers are, I think everyone's just still readjusting because like last year um, we all went from not working at all to then working maybe like two days or three days because nobody could come into Tasmania so it was only the locals that were going out so everywhere just opened a little bit to test the water to now going back to full time is actually kind of um, it's a bit of a culture shock again I think and um, so I feel like everyone's still um, kind of working their way through that and figuring out like if that is what they want. Like I know a bunch of people who have decided they didn't want um, such a stressful job or a stressful career and are going to like just working three days somewhere. Um, there's a lot of that going on. And um, I guess I'm kind of waiting to see where we all come out of it on the other side and what it all looks like then. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it did seem like, you know, when you're forced to kind of just take on the essentials that so many people are making these decisions of like big life changes and you know everyone was sort of forced to pivot and it's been so incredibly inspiring in so many ways to see businesses pivot into something really really cool and it's I'm I am eager to see in our community too how that evolves and um, it's it is incredibly difficult but you know creative people and figure out a way to make it work and to be honest well, Tassie is luckier than most because we only had one lockdown as opposed to Melbourne or other places so like some people I know in Melbourne like the constant pivoting was a lot and was really emotionally taxing for them but in Tassie yeah. because we probably had to do it once I feel like maybe people are in a slightly better place because of that yeah that's a good point okay we'll just take a couple more questions um, oh, someone is asking if you make any beverages with the fruits or the plants that you forage. I know wines, gins, and juices are made in Tassie, but have you ever made any? Um, oh, no, I don't think I have made any of those. I make, um, I make a lot of vinegars. So normally last year during one of my COVID projects was 120 liters of apple cider vinegar because I was like, well, there's a lot a lot of wild apples and I can do this while social distancing on my own. So I drove around for literally like three weeks collecting wild apples, bought a slow juicer and a bunch of buckets and just like spent an entire week just juicing these apples um, and then like putting vinegar muffins into them. Um, anyway, so I make a lot of shrubs. So like it's berry season and stone fruit season at the moment. So I've probably put down like 10 shrubs at least in my kitchen at the moment. Um, there's a basic recipe in the book, so I tend to do like one part fruit, one part honey, and one part raw apple cider vinegar, hence why I need so much vinegar. And then just ferment out eventually, um, like strain the fruit solids out, use them in like cooking or a dessert or something. 
and then um, keep the shrubs in bottles and I mix them with soda water. And that's also my like, um, the black currant one with soda water is my like no fail hangover cure as well. Oh, good to know. Natural vitamin C plus like the honey and stuff. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, that um, sounds amazing. Mainly those and a lot of kombucha. Mm. I just imagining you bottling all this apple cider vinegar and driving around the island, bringing it to everyone. <laughs> Much, that's pretty much what happens. Everyone yeah. always looks at the back of my car and um, yeah, and they're like, what have you got now? What's in there today? It could literally be anything. Um, and then I, my first flight in a year, when I went to Sydney for the weekend to do a photo shoot, Virgin lost my suitcase. And I was like, oh, I've forgotten about this, um, these aspects of traveling. And then they're like, so they lost your suitcase and you had a wallaby inside it. And I was like, I was like, you're making it sound stranger than it is. I was like, there were ice packs, like it was in a chili bag. It just happened to be in my suitcase. And so my suitcase is like driving around Sydney somewhere with like a wallaby inside it for this photo shoot so I can cook wallaby. And like, and I was like, it's not as weird as it sounds. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> that seems totally, I mean, I've traveled with some strange stuff as well. I, I often get like the little note inside your luggage. So I was like, uh, we had to, go thoroughly through your luggage to see what on earth was happening in here. I'm just like, I get it, but I've never traveled with Wallaby. And I just feel like that is a perfect way to end this conversation. <laughs> it's just a, a beautiful image, but um, there are so many, so many more questions. Um, sorry that we did not get to your question. Thank you for offering up your questions. And Annalise, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. I appreciate your time. I thoroughly enjoyed having this conversation. Um, there's so many more things I would love to sit and talk to you about, but someday maybe in Tasmania, we can cook over the fire together and I can try some possum and wallaby. But, um, and thank you for putting this out into the world. It is such a gift for all of us. And you guys, I, I don't know if you all have your copies yet, but it is the closest that we can get right now to traveling. It is such a wonderful way to spend an even evening just pouring over these images and marking the pages of recipes that you want to try. So um, thank you again for the gift of your time and, and your artistry. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been a really nice thing to be able to share and like it's really exciting to see it go so far. Like, I find it really surreal that I'm in Tasmania and I'm speaking to people in the U.S. That's crazy. It is amazing. It is, you know, it's one of the things of that is sort of a gift of this pandemic. One of the few things that we can, you know, we're sitting in a room right now of what, close to 80 people and we can, we can be having this amazing and intimate conversation doing it virtually. So it's pretty cool. Thank, Thank you both. Hi, <laughs> um, I loved being a fly on the wall for that conversation. That was really lovely. Um, and I'm like filled, filled with wanderlust. I can't wait to travel again. <laughs> can't wait to be um, beautiful places like Tasmania, hopefully um, someday in the future, in the near future. Um, as we close out tonight, I just wanted to thank you, Annalise and Ashley, for joining us and taking the time to talk to all of our participants, all of our attendees today uh, from all over the world. Um, again, the book, um, How Wild Things Are, is available online at booklarder.com. So if you'd like to purchase a copy, head over to our website. And um, like I mentioned, this chat will be posted on our YouTube channel within 48 hours um, of the event. So uh, I'll share, uh, we'll share a link for, with everyone who, um, who registered that'll come through via Zoom email. Um, that's all that I have prepared tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Be safe, be well, and happy cooking to, to all of you. Thank you. All right. Peace. Bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye.